The Paul Leslie Interviews. So how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing okay. It's one of those, it, it seems to me that we have a lot of really busy studio days lately, and that's why when I said between 11 and 12 is, is good for us as we start recording at 12. That's California time. <laughs> We're doing great. I just came back from a nice little run, and, and things are going well. So there's going to be a third Thin Drum album. Yes, eventually. We've got three songs done, and we've just been so busy in the in the studio that we've... <laughs> You know, jeopardize time for Tin Drum. We just, you know, we're doing so many other people. We're recording so many other people. And because my husband, Burley Drummond, plays drums and percussion and sings, and I play keyboards, we can pretty much take care of a, a whole album because I can do keyboard, bass, and guitar, and keyboards, and sing. And that, we've been real busy with that. But we are trying to get back into it, and we do have three songs that are complete, and we're real excited about that. So, how did Tin Drum form initially? Well, actually, I was on the road a lot, and my husband, Curly Drummond, was on the road a lot with Ambrosia. I was on the road with Jimmy Buffett, and we realized that probably the best way for us to see each other was to get in a band together, <laughs> and both of us write, and so we started combining our writing efforts, and Tim Drum just became through that, and gosh, we've been together. I'm trying to think now. We've been together probably 15, 17 years, something like that. We just have a great time. It's rest with pop rock, and we really get to utilize our writing and our, our singing and our performing that, in that way. There's lots of nice, good musicians, too, you know, that we've got to play with. Luis Conte, I don't know if you've heard of him. Oh, yeah, the Congo player. Oh, yeah. He plays with us when he's in town. And Bree Darling, who used to also play percussion with Jimmy Buffett, she plays with us sometimes when she's available. Bree Howard? Yeah, Brie Howard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Her name is now Brie Darling, but that's who it was, Brie Howard. And she's one of my best friends, and we've done a lot of projects together. She plays with Tim Drum when she's available, and Kevin McCormick and Nick Mahan, lots of musicians that are pretty well known through, through the years. We just have a great time. And, and you have some Tim Drum CDs? Oh, yeah, I have The Real World and The Small Parade both. Did we send those to you? I can't, I can't remember. Yeah, you sure did. And I thank you. It's it's really very different. Not something you hear on FM radio, and that's a good thing. <laughs> no, I know. Well, I'm just curious. Is there any particular songs on it that you like more than others that you play? Or I really like South African Way. Oh, yeah. That's a, a favorite of mine. I like the last song on the Small Parade album, You Might Need Me. Oh, you do? Great. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Well, that's so funny because we just came back from South Africa. We as a family went to South Africa and did some music over there for a benefit for some an orphanage, AIDS orphanage, and we had a great time. It was really a great, life-changing experience. We just got back in December, so that was great. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So how did you personally get started with music? I started taking lessons, piano lessons, when I was five years old. My mom was a piano player, singer. I remember my dad buying her a piano, and I guess I just sat down at it with her and kind of picked out the left hand that she was doing, and they realized that was when I was four, that I had uh, some passion and, and, and a little bit of a a natural knack for it, so they started giving me piano lessons at five. And I come from a family of five kids, and all of us grew up in music, music with our bands, family bands, and I just took piano lessons up until I was in high school, and then, you know, I sang all through that time, too, and started taking voice lessons in, in high school, and actually got into my first band when I was a freshman in high school. So it's just kind of part of my growing up was doing music lessons and performing and talent shows, and, and I pretty much knew from the time I started that music was what I wanted to do forever. <laughs> I'm still doing it. I guess the dream has come true. Oh, yeah. And then I guess when I, I was about 21, 22, I moved down to Los Angeles and started getting connected to the, the, the music industry in Los Angeles. And that's where I met a lot of people that I play with, you know, and I sang and played on a lot of people's albums and toured and it just kind of spread through there. That's why I moved down to L.A. was for music. And now I live in Thousand Oaks, but close enough. We have a studio at our house, but we're still close enough to, to Los Angeles to see the studio work there. That's pretty much how it all came together. I was very curious about, I read in a, a biography on Tindrum, that you uh, had some uh, work experience with Pink Floyd. 
Yes, I got to sing on two of the songs, and this is really embarrassing, but I can only remember one <laughs> One World on a live video in 19, it was either 1987, 1988, somewhere, somewhere around that time, and uh, we went into Cap I know uh, James Guthrie, the producer of Pink Floyd, and he had me and two other singers come in and do some sweetening in the Capitol Records for a live video that Pink Floyd did. That was That was amazing. That was so much fun. I had so much fun doing that, and that was pretty much pretty much it for for Pink Floyd. You know that 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 you know that was my experience with them, but it was so much fun. We really had a great time, and it came out sounding pretty good. And it's terrible because people ask me, you know, what are the two songs that I have? It's terrible. I can only remember the name of one of them, and I love Pink Floyd, but. One of these days, I should really go back and look at which one, <laughs> what the other one was that I sang on. Well, I'll definitely have to track it down. That sounds... Yeah, but it is a live video that they did, and it was around 1987, 1988, during that era. Okay. And the one thing that also was uh, kind of interesting was about Alan Parsons producing one of the one of the cuts. Yes, Surrender. Alan Parsons is a very good friend of ours. He worked a lot with Ambrosia, which is my husband's band. So we got to know, I mean, we've known Alan for years. And he heard that song while we were doing the album, doing the CD at the time, and he said he would like to produce it because he really believed in that song. Actually, that song probably has had more radio play than any of our songs. That's why I was just kind of curious which one you were interested in. But And so he took, so we went into, well, we were recording in Michael Burdick's studio in Burbank, and he came in and just said, I would like to help produce that song. And he said, sure, come on in. And it was great. <laughs> and we loved what he did. And, and actually, you know, he, we used a lot of what he, he uh, produced on it, but we actually did a lot of our, our production on that, too. So it was kind of a mixture of the three of us producing that. But, and that was one of those songs that we wrote real last minute on the CD. It was one that we basically wrote while we were recording the CD. And it just came so fast. Sometimes they come real fast, and sometimes they don't. But and that was yeah. Alan Parsons is just a great, great, great friend of ours, a great musician, and we just love him. I was curious about the the name of the band Tin Drum, and my first my first guess that it was like a some kind of play on Burley Drummond. Yes, actually, it kind of is more about Burley. He well, we there, there's a foreign film called Tin Drum. And it's basically about a boy that had his drum that did not want to grow up. He wanted to stay a kid. And everything in his life, and there was lots of drama going on in his life, and everything in his life was pretty traumatic. And so he just wanted to stay. His drum was like his saving grace, and he just did not want to grow up. He wanted to stay. And that was kind of a little bit... We have a lot of percussion, a lot of drums in our band, and Burley's a drummer, and so we kind of based it around that because we wanted to keep it sort of childlike and fun and, and adventurous. So it came from that. Basically, it came from the foreign film called Tin Drum. And the album covers kind of conjure up a childish kind of reminiscing, I think. Exactly. Now, are you talking about Small Parade or Real World? Both of them. Yeah. To me. <laughs> well, part of it, both of those are our kids, by the way. I thought so. Yeah. I wondered. <laughs> and uh, the one real world is our son, who's now 19 years old. And Small Parade is our daughter, who's now 10 years old. And real world, a lot of people have, have specified our music as world beat type music also. Eclectic from different types of, of world beat music, too. And even though it's more progressive pop rock, we talk a little bit about world issues. And, and there's, you know, a lot of percussion that gives you a little bit of a, a world beat flavor. And... That's kind of the world on real world effect. And Small Parade is just your walk through life. But yes, it is kind of childlike, you know, and that's, that's another reason why Tin Drum kind of fits <laughs> the band because if you ever see the movie, it's, it's really about the joys of childhood and, and, and life. That's pretty much where that comes from. Yeah, it sounds like I've, I've got my research ahead of me. I'm going to have to see this movie now. <laughs> yes, yes, great. It's a good movie. It is a very good movie. So how did you come to be a coral reefer? Well, Bree Howard, who's now Bree Darling, said that they were looking. She had already got, I believe she had already had the gig as a percussion singer. And she said they were looking for another singer that was blondish. Well, at the time, my hair was dark. <laughs> but it was like kind of sun bleached a little bit. So I kind of just did a little weave to it. And we, basically, it was the easiest audition I've ever done. We were at, I believe it's the Malibu Inn. Jimmy was living there at the time. 
or stay in there. He and Jane were split up at the time, and he was he just wanted to audition very, very casually. So he said, I'll just come to my room. And there was like three of us, I believe. He said, just come to my room, and I'll hear you sing. I'll, I have my guitar, and, you know, I just want to check out your vibe. I want to check out your singing. I want to check out, you know, see if this would all work together. So we went in, and we sang in his room, all of us sitting with him and the guitar on, on, you know, in the middle of the room. And we had the gig. We got the gig. It was that easy. So who were the other two? Hey, the, at that time, the girl, it was Dina Iverson. She already had the gig. She had, she had toured the year before. And a girl named Catherine Maisnick, who was scared to death. <laughs> I can totally remember her doing that audition. She was just scared to death. And then Bree went with me, too. She came, too, because I think he still wanted to check her out, check her singing out. So that's who who the two singers were at that time. But that was the only year I, I toured with them because they got he got two new singers after that, and then it was me with two other singers. Just out of curiosity, do you still keep in touch with the other? Yes, I do. You know, I mean, not a lot, but I mean, they. It was such an. I mean, when I the first time I quit was because of my son. It was just hard to be on the road, and they were so nice. They were so understanding. Jimmy was so understanding because he's a family guy, and then they hired me back. Because they said their tours were going to be a little less, and they paid me a lot more. And I did two more tours. So I did two tours, 91, 90, no, 90, 91, and then 93 and 94. So when I came back in 93 and 94, I still had so much fun. But then I realized that's not why I quit was because of the money. I quit because I needed to be home with my family, and it was really hard being on the road. And at the time, I just had my son. And so I did two more years with them, and then I quit again, and they were still so understanding. <laughs> they were still, there was never, ever, ever any ill feelings at all. Jimmy was very understanding. The whole administration was understanding. And the band, I love the band. I just love them. We, we, were, we all became very good friends. And even though I don't talk to them or email them that often, we still keep in touch. You know, Christmas cards. Jimmy usually sends sends us a family Christmas card and you know every once in a while I'll get an email from them and but not a lot you know everybody's so busy and I mean and I'm so bad when they play in the area I should go see them play but it seems like every time they're in the area I'm either in the studio or I'm playing so I haven't seen them in years you know I basically gave Tina Tina Golickson my gig I said Tina you would be perfect for this gig I think that they would love you and she's had it ever since perfect because she doesn't have any kids you know she's she loves it, and she's great. I mean, I talk to her quite a bit. Not a, quite a bit, but she lives in L.A. We still keep in contact. And, and Amy Lee, she emails me a lot. I talk probably stay in contact with her almost more than any of them. So when you think about the years that you were, the years you were in the Coral Reefer Band, is there any memory or fun, fun memory, I guess, that, that stands out? You know, I had so much fun. There's so many fond memories. I can't even think of anything bad to say. I mean, it's just amazing. Everything that I did with, with the Buffett Band was so much fun. We used to have, oh, man, what do we call it? Bus theater. <laughs> we used to just do fun things, and there'd be two buses, and one bus would try to do this bus theater, and we'd look at the, through the windows and see their little things that they do, and then they would look at what we do, do little dances and just crazy <laughs> stuff, you know, and then. They'd play volleyball. I love playing volleyball. I'm big time into volleyball. And Mooney would help get volleyball games together wherever possible with the band. And that was a lot of fun. Just hanging out with them was fun. Playing music. They're an incredible band. You know, the Mayer Brothers and Roger and, oh my gosh, it's just Mike Utley. They're all just amazing musicians. And we all got along so great. It was just like a family. That was the hardest thing about quitting is because they're like leaving my family or some of my very best friends. I just, we had a lot of great memories. Volleyball, going out to nice dinners here and there, seeing places, the uh, parrot heads, being on stage with the parrot heads out there, it was just wild. It was invigorating. It was great. I mean, the audiences were just wonderful and exciting. It was like a huge carnival every, every night that you play. And traveling was fun. There's just so many memories. I can't even, I don't even think I'm skimming the circus. Speaking of Jimmy Buffett's band, was there any particular person in the band that you felt closer to? Well, of course, Bree, because she's been my best friend for years, you know. I mean, we went into that band together, so she, we've done so many projects together. It's like, I can't even tell you how many projects we've done. So I knew her well before we even got in the band, so obviously her. 
But no, I mean, really, I felt close to all of them. I, lo- you know, I loved hanging out with Pete, Jim, Roger, Amy, Claudia, Nikki. I, I really can't say any, any. We really, it was like a nice group of people. And I, I think everybody got along great. Right? Robert, I love Robert. He's a kick. Fingers, you know, and I, I just, we just had so much fun. We did, we did a lot of things as groups. But of course, you know, you share the dressing rooms with the women, so you get, you definitely get close with them. But no, I never had any slight problem with anyone in that band. We just had so much fun. I mean, it was really sad when I quit. It was a really hard thing for me to do. And, but there was no ill feelings and everybody totally understanding. So when you were growing up, what kind of music did you listen to? Well, it's funny, you know, I took classical piano as a kid. And so by the time I got in high school, I was really sick of classical. Now I totally appreciate it again. But so I kind of went kind of in a rock direction. Jimi Hendrix, Seven Wolves, Deep Purple, <laughs> through my high school years. And then when I got through high school, into college, I started getting more into eclectic jazz, still was into the rock, progressive rock, all kinds of music. By the time I was in college, I liked all kinds of music. It's hard to say my favorite styles of music, but, you know, I was in, I of course, through college, I was in a few top 40 bands. And a lot of people compare my piano playing to Billy Payne from Little Feet. I really idolized him as a piano player. And I listened to Bonnie Raitt, so I vocal style sometimes when compared to her. I love Bonnie Raitt. I love Little Feet. I love that kind of music, too. So in my 20s, I kind of more listened to that music. But I have to say, I listen to lots of different music. Police, Sheryl Crow, Elton John, all kinds of music. And, and and even some of the more, a little bit more jazz stuff, because we, we some of the bands I was in, we did some more fusion-type jazz stuff, too. You know, and I always liked Jimmy Buffett, too. So that was that was fun to, to be in a band with Jimmy Buffett. And actually, the, the end of March, I'm playing keyboards and singing with, with Ambrosia and Edgar Winter and Bob Welsh from Fleetwood Mac. And, oh gosh, I can't remember his name, the guy from Jefferson Starship. It's kind of a 70s review, and they need a keyboard singer, keyboard player singer. So I'm going to be trying to do some cram, cramming and learning lots of different artists for that show, which I'm looking forward to. I think that will be fun. I sing with Ambrosia sometimes when they don't, they, it's, it's a male thing, but when they they can't find their male to do their high tenor stuff, they, they have me come and do some singing, which they might have me do a lot more of in the future. So we'll see where that goes. And Tin Drum, too. We've got some Tin Drum gigs coming up. That'll be fun. Is there any particular Tin Drum song that, you, uh, that was cut on the album that stands out as a favorite one or maybe a more meaningful one? For me or for the public? For you. I guess Small Parade, song Small Parade, because it's kind of a love song duet. That has a lot of meaning to us, you know, because it's about family and it's about marriage and, and love. And it, and it comes from our heart, you know. There's a lot of songs that are fun that we do. I mean, like, Luck of the Irish is just kind of a piano, fun, instrumental. And, you know, you, you feed off the audience. The audience... I'll tell you the song that the audience probably get the most compliments live is Alabaster. Because we just do it with piano and vocal. We don't do it with the whole band. And there's an intimacy to that. People, boy, I'll tell you, they, they, we get more requests for that than anything. And Surrender. Surrender was probably our biggest radio play song. Our favorites of ours that we like, it just depends. It depends what kind of concert we're doing. If we're doing more an energetic concert or if we're doing more of an acoustic type concert, it just depends. There's lots of songs that we that, are, that we're really close to. Surrender, Alabaster, Luck of the Irish, like I said, Small Parade, I Someday, the song that really sings it, that we really like. Real World, that's got kind of a little bit of a political message that we like. And Lay Your Hands is fun for up-tempo. And I guess that's kind of some of our favorites. I mean, the three new songs that we have right now are probably even, I mean, because they're newer. We're real excited about those. You know, one of them is, is a song that, that I sing that actually my, my daughter starts out singing when she was really young. And then it turns into the full band singing with my voice. And then there's another one that's just a rocker that's just a good old bluesy boogie rocker that really sings and I play piano. In fact, it's just really nice playing. It's just piano and drums and him singing. There's another one that's kind of a little bit more of a duet. It's kind of middle of the road, kind of rock. You know what I mean? It's just not too, it's not slow, it's not fast. So you kind of have three different types of songs. What is the typical tin drum fan 
like. But how would you describe the majority of, of the fans? Because that was something I was wondering about when I was listening. Because I kind of got the world vibe from it. But then I thought, I really think it's, it's the kind of music that could appeal to a, a wide variety of people. Young people, older people. Mm-hmm. You kind of nailed it on the head. There's a lot of people that can relate to it in a family sense. So you do, we do have an audience of big, varied audiences. The kids like it. The kids like it because it's kind of childlike in some ways. And then, you know, we even have older crowds that like it because some of it's not fashion, hard rock, you know. It's, so we do, we have, we do have a little bit. And it's funny because maybe my kids' age and their friends, my son is, is 19 years old, so a lot of his friends come and see us. And because he, we all, we have our kids sit in with us. Nicky, my son, is a great drummer, singer, and he plays keyboards and guitar, and he usually comes and sits in with us, so his friends come, and then they take a liking to it, and then our friends, so we've got probably ranges from kids up through 60-year-old people. It's like we do have a little bit of an age spread, so it's like, but it's not, it's hard, because like if somebody wants to come and just dance to every song. Ours wouldn't be that type of music. Yes, some of our songs are dance songs, but some of them are very eclectic, more progressive. And if there's people that want to come and just dance all night, then we're not the right band, unless we just did our dance songs and that's it. Yeah. Our music's a little more, some of it is, a little more listening type music. The stations that played a lot of, that played Surrender a lot, were like mostly easy listening. So how did you meet Burley Drummond? Well, music. I moved down to L.A., and actually my cousin, who's a guitar player, who used to play with Warren Zevon, was Burley's roommate. And so I moved down to L.A. and immediately got in a band with my cousin, and Burley was a drummer. I never believed in that, but it was basically love at first sight. It was just, it just clicked amazingly quick, and that's how we met. I got the vibe from listening to the music. I kind of got the vibe that you were very friendly people. <laughs> and, you know, uh, that's what people say. And it's funny because I think we are. Because a lot of people, <laughs> they, we get calls and they say, oh, it's so nice to listen to songs that aren't all about breaking up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and thinking about it, it's like you, when you think of the majority of the love songs out there, I mean, really, it, there's a high percentage of, of love songs about breaking up. Unless you go back to the 40s and listen to those songs, and those are all... <laughs> positive love songs, and we have heard that a lot about our music being positive, and I think Burley and I as people are positive people, and I think if you talk to anybody in, in Jimmy Buffett's band, they'd probably tell you the same thing, but we really had a good time. So when you look back on your life, what do you think the best thing about being Mary Harris is? Well, I think I'm very fortunate that I've been able to do what I've been able to do because of my music, and I would never change that. I hope that my messages as a musician and singer come across positive to people. And, you know, I just, I think I've lived a great life. You know, I'm running half marathons now. I'm, I'm still doing my music as strong as ever. I'm featuring studio work and performing. And I teach piano and voice also. I really love my life. And I have to say that I guess I did choose my family. I made that a priority in my life as they were growing up over music, over touring. And still able to do my music, and I wouldn't change that either. I still, my daughter's 10 years old. We're still going strong with raising, and my son's gone. He's in college, so, I mean, obviously, he's not gone, gone, but, you know. It's, it's tough, though. I mean, it's a rough business, but I would not change it, and I feel fortunate that I've had the gift of talent. That's pretty much it. So my last question to you, given that this show goes out all over the world, thanks to modern technology, what would you, Mary Harris, like to say to the world? Hmm. I guess I just would like to see more peace in the world, and I would like people to enjoy music and enjoy life and look at the positive side of things. Don't dwell on the negative because you will magnet that. And just remember, there's a lot, a lot of good out there, a lot of great musicians, a lot of great music, and just enjoy life. Thank you so much for giving me the time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Well, thank you so much, Paul, and good luck with everything, and hopefully I'll talk to you in the future.